Hey everybody and welcome to Hell is for Children. This show is on every Saturday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time, which is 2100 hours Central European Time. My name is Gerta Franken and this show is all about the topic of protective mothers and their children. So what's a protective mother? A protective mother tries to protect her child or children from their abusive father by many means necessary, which is an uphill battle in today's global corrupt family court system that thrives on paternal entitlements. And let me start with wishing everyone a very Merry Christmas on this 2016 Christmas Eve, and in particular the protective moms who are watching tonight, since most of, most of us are not celebrating Christmas with our kids, and that is extremely difficult. Um, I want to start this show um, by sharing a protective mother um, fundraiser for our show to keep our show on the air uh, for 2017 and you can find um, the fund drive here on GoFundMe. We need $1,200 a year to stay on air so if you can make a donation I really appreciate it. Um, we're due for January so please everyone um, even if you can just spare five bucks um, it's very much appreciated. Um, so that's where you can find that. Um, and without further ado, um, I want to introduce um, protective mother Scotta Campbell. And um, Scotta uh, lost custody of her daughter to her abusive ex in an international custody battle, despite evidence of child molestation. And Scotta is joining us from Norway this evening. So welcome to Hell is for Children, Scotta. Thank you, Goethe. Thank you very much for inviting me on your program. Um, I would like to start by saying um, I'm not a victim, but I'm a survivor. Uh, and I'm a warrior mother who did everything under the um, hellish circumstances as a single protective mother uh, to my one and only daughter, Hedda from court abduction and abuse by the criminal world court system and in the support of the abusive father. This is our seventh Christmas. We have not celebrated together. Before, before you move on, um, move the microphone a little bit closer to your mouth so you're a little louder because right now the volume is a little low and we want to hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Is that better, Biggie? Okay, that's better, he says. So, okay. so you haven't seen your daughter uh, for seven, you haven't had her for seven Christmas. Seven Christmases this year. Okay. Um, and um, this is Christmas Eve in Norway, and this is when we celebrate Christmas. So it makes it impossible for me to celebrate Christmas. Um, so I would like to wish for a Christmas gift uh, for all the mothers, the motherless children of our uh, court abducted, court abduction to the abusive fathers around the world to be reunited with the mothers. That's my wish and gift um, that I would like to give. And I believe this is all our wishes around the world. Um, it's it's the gift we want, and I think our children too would desperately want that. Yeah. So that's uh, what I have to say about that. Um, uh, Take us to how you became a protective mother. Let's let's start when. Um, you and your ex were still together and um, things fell apart. How old was your daughter at that point? Uh, things fell apart uh, when he had a, an affair. And um, my daughter was four at the time. Uh, and we tried counseling and it you know, it just he wasn't interested basically, and I think that uh, when you know these uh, 
father to have personality disorders, uh, which uh, seems to be a pattern here. Um, you know, when they get caught out in something that they want to do, and uh, if they get caught out, uh, then um, basically, uh, you know, they become very violent and aggressive. So it started with that, um, that he became very aggressive and uh, and it started off in 2005 where uh, he even pushed me and things like this. And uh, the home then had to, he wanted to sell our home because he went bankrupt and wanted to go abroad to do some work. And uh, I said, well, if you want to go abroad, then I really would like to move to uh, Australia because uh, the weather in England didn't suit me very well. So you were both, you're all, the three of you were living in the UK at this point, Yeah, we were in the UK in Brighton, um, okay. and uh, I had problems with the climate there because of the damp. It never suited me. Uh, our child was, Hedda was very, very interested in going barefoot. She loved nature. She loved uh, animals. And uh, I was fortunate enough to have an Australian resident at that point. So I decided, I said to him, well, I would like to go to Australia. And as you know, you can't leave a country with... Okay. Okay, we had some issues with uh, audio. We're trying to bump up the audio of, of uh, Scotta because it's a little bit low. So we're going to ask Scotta to... Um to speak up a little bit and um, just speak loudly. That might help, I hope. <laughs> I hope so. All right. I think I put my glasses on. That might help as well, actually. <laughs> okay, so you, you were all, but where we were in the story is you, all, the three of you were living in the UK, even though you are from Norway and your ex is from the UK. Is that correct? Uh, he was born in South Africa, but he grew up from the age of four in the UK. Okay. And then uh, when things fell apart and he became violent, um, you asked his permission to move to Australia with your daughter, and he okayed that, yes? He okayed that, and uh, he had to sign for her in a Norwegian passport. So, you know, there was no way that I could have gone to Australia without his permission. Um, and uh, so in 2005, December, uh, he leaves to the States and I leave for Australia. Um, so uh, he also even agreed in Australia for uh, regularizing the Australian immigration status for Heather because we needed to sort her immigration out. Um, and we moved to Byron Bay, um, New South Wales. Uh, I chose Byron Bay. I actually have friends all over Australia and family, but I chose Byron Bay because Byron Bay um, was a place that I'd been many years prior, and I really, really loved it. And it's, it's very beautiful nature there. There's lots of animals. And I thought it was idyllic for, for Heather to grow up there. And um, also there were lots of single mothers there. So I thought it sounds like a perfect place. Um, so the father came in 2006, uh, my ex. And he came um, and visited. Um, and I always let him have contact with Hedda whenever he knew where we were. He had our telephone numbers. Uh, we, however, weren't able to contact him. Um, and um, when he came in 2006, he uh, was basically, he was paying maintenance actually at this time too. And uh, he, he said to me that he wanted me to sponsor him into Australia. Um, now, 
um, I said to him, well, do you want to live in Australia? And we actually had a counseling session when he came. And he said, no, he had absolutely no intention of living in Australia. He, uh, he wanted to live in New York. But he wanted to have Um, sorry, I can't hear you, Goethe. So why did he want to get sponsored at this point? Well, he said that it would be much easier for him to come in and out of Australia than to, to apply for visas, which, you know, made sense to me at the time because I wanted to encourage their relationship despite our relationship, you know. Uh, that wasn't very good. Um, so I was an encouraging parent um, all along. Um, and uh, so I did. We went um, to Brisbane um, and filled out all the applications. And that night when we came home, uh, he assaulted me for the first time really badly. Uh, threw me across the room and I was concussed for 24 hours and uh, it was winter and I woke up naked on my bed uh, with blood down my face and of course like a lot of us mothers we don't do the right thing. Uh, I didn't call the police, I went to wash off the blood because I didn't want my daughter to see me like that. And um, so I didn't call the police. Um, we we also um, he left the next day after that happened. Um, so the next time he came was in 2007, uh, January, December and January actually. And I wrote him a letter. I had a lawyer's letter stating that I wanted a divorce, and uh, he was not allowed to stay with us you know, this time. Um, he ignored my lawyer's letter. He ignored my request uh, to not stay with us um, and just arrived. And, uh, you know, when you have never been in these situations, you actually don't know what the right thing is to do. You kind of like helpless and, and he knew that I knew nobody there yet. You know, I was pretty new, so I hadn't formed like really strong bond. Um, and um, so we went to uh, actually a parenting plan and had a parenting plan made out by a very good ex-lawyer. Uh, but when it came to the signing, he refused to sign it. Uh, so he goes abroad again. Um, and um, Oh, also on that visit, he, he um, took my daughter when we were walking on the street and he just sort of grabbed her and ran off with her. And it was just all crazy, you know. So I went to the police, actually, at that time. And I said to them, look, I'm being bullied. I'm, I, you know, I've, I've had this experience before. And he's running off with my daughter. This is just really, like, uh, not very... Um, good for our daughter, you know, uh, this behaviour. And they just basically, the police in New South Wales, in, in Byron Bay, New South Wales, said to me, uh, basically that uh, unless I had black and blue bruises, they wouldn't do anything. It's ridiculous they should have given you a protective order against them, you know? They wouldn't. They wouldn't. Uh, and then uh, in, uh, in April 2007, I decided to move me and my daughter more inland because Byron Bay is a very transient place. So, um, you know, I wanted it to be more stable, like the people that she's at school with is more stable, you know, because in Byron Bay people come and go and it's a big holiday place as well. So we moved to Mullumbimby and I moved my daughter to the most idyllic place. Uh, it was up the main on school. It's, um, uh, it's, it's quite a hippie kind of place, but it's fantastic because it's, um, at school there, you know, you have lots of peacocks wandering around. It's, uh, you know, they were doing gardening and they were learning how to grow their own vegetables. They had 
circus classes, yoga classes. I mean, it was just fantastic. You know, it was also a public school. It wasn't private, you know. Um, and I got a lovely home where we had avocado trees. We had guana lizards walking through our garden. We had kangaroos. We had um, echidnas. You know, I mean, it was just a beautiful place. Yeah, it sounds wonderful. Yeah, really wonderful place. And um, so we moved there. And um, and then um, all of a sudden, uh, my ex, Tesla, he he now gets himself a, a job in Sydney. Okay, so he moved to Australia after all. So he moved to Australia in October 2007. Uh, and I thought, well, that's okay. Sydney is, is, is good enough. You know, it's not, if he's not living here, it's fine, you know. I felt that was okay because uh, I didn't know that he was having an agenda. I mean, I, I had no idea about his agenda. Um, so in September 2007, um, which is a photo that you have of Hedda hugging a tree, was actually the last time Hedda came to Norway. I, I took her to Norway because my grandmother was having her 90th birthday and uh, I, I wanted uh, Hedda to uh, see the whole family. Uh, she had a fantastic time. Uh, she met both sides of the family. She's got like 30 cousins, um, you know, on a uh, you know, around her age group. Um, so she had a really, really, really fantastic time. And uh, so I'd say that was the last time my daughter ever came to Norway. That was in September 2007. Um, in January 2008, um, Hedda's father, my ex, uh, Chester, wanted Hedda to travel uh, to Sydney for, uh, you know, to have a holiday with him. And uh, Hedda, you know, she she didn't really want to go. You know, she was very, very, didn't want to go. Um, she was throwing up in the car, going to the airport. And I said to her, look, you know, it's only for a few days. Um, uh, it'll be fun. You know, the same thing, encouraging, encouraging. Um, and when she was there, she used to call me every night saying she wanted to come home. Uh, she didn't like being there. Uh, and um, anyway, the, uh, her father decided to fly back with her. And, um, it, and she came back with chronic eczema again. And uh, her father um, uh, said, oh, it's my birthday, so can you please... Uh, allow me to come to the house and celebrate my birthday with her, you know, because uh, his birthday is more important even than her birthday. <laughs> so, uh, no, I just had to say that. Anyway, um, <laughs> it's so insane, this thing, it's so insane. But anyway, so he comes and uh, so I said, okay. I thought, okay, well, I'll invite some friends and, you know, we'll try and work this through again, you know, being, you know, the compassionate mother I am and ex-partner. Uh, so he comes to our home. And uh, I don't know, I must have popped out of something that day when he was there and he then married up my email account to his email without me knowing it. That evening, he was going to spend one night, uh, and I thought it would go well, but of course it didn't. He assaulted me again, um, and I left with my daughter, and we went to some friends, and I went straight away to the police because I had bruising and I had a cut on my hand, and um, I went to the police, and I said, look, um, you know, you need to do a restraining order. The policeman said to me, because he left for overseas again the next day, 
And he said to me, no, because the father's left the country, we can't do that. Um, so now I'm like really concerned about Hedda. And uh, she starts attending play therapy with a psychologist called Liz Hallam. Um, and uh, so she started seeing her in March 2008. And then he wants to see Hedda again and uh, in Sydney. Um, and I said yes again. Um, but at this time I said to Hedda, I'm going to fly with you. So I flew with Hedda down to Sydney because I, was, I decided to go to Alice Springs so I could fly down with her and pick her up on the way back. Uh, I had a friend in Alice and uh, I have always had a great interest in Aboriginal art. So um, I flew down to Sydney uh, um, and her father was very delayed in picking her up, which nearly caused me to miss my flight. And he came and he snatched Heather from me and really hurled abuse, verbal abuse at me. And I was absolutely shaking, you know, because I, I just thought, you know, how this is affecting Heather. And so I went to Alice. And every night, Hedda called me and said that she wanted to come home. She wasn't happy. Uh, she didn't like staying where he was staying. And um, I, whilst I was in Alice, I actually had the prospect of getting work there because I was so driven by the art of the Aboriginal people there, um, which I absolutely think is so fantastic and very inspiring. Um, and so uh, I just mentioned that because of the marrying up of my emails. Um, so I went back to Sydney, picked up Hedda, and she again had chronic eczema, uh, was so happy to see me. She just like ran and just, you know, jumped into my arms. And, and I just thought there's something that just doesn't seem right here somehow. Um, why, why is she so unhappy? Um, uh, and I was attending domestic violence counselling at this stage um, as well. Um, now, as soon as I had applied for this work, or with the prospect of moving, the father moved into our area. Um, and I hadn't worked out yet that um, he was connected to my email. I hadn't worked that out yet. Um, but um, that came when, um, when I took contact with his sister of 25 years. He hadn't had contact with her for 25 years, and I managed to get contact with her. That's when things really started to take off, because now I was really able to get to know about some family secrets that he really didn't want anybody to know about. Um, anyway, then um, he leaves Australia. Uh, this is in August. Hold on, yeah. So um, then in, uh, at the end of uh, 2008. It's Hedda's birthday. It's her seventh birthday. And he really said, please, can I come to the birthday? I want to see her. And I thought, well, there'll be people there, so I don't have to worry. I just said to him, you're not welcome to stay longer than so many hours. Um, and he invited people that I didn't even know. He invited people I didn't know. He invited uh, some children that he had met with Hedda that I didn't know. So, you know, he does all these kind of outlandish things at times. Um, and then in 2008, um, Christmas um, is when things really kicked off, um, when his mother arrived. Because unfortunately, these people, you know, these men that have these disorders, um, they come from dysfunctional families. A lot of them that it's all to do with um, it's all to do with um, abuse that they've experienced 
um, and um, they had bonds to their abusers. So his mother, who had abused him and his his sibling, uh, came to Christmas to help him with the situation because his sister was involved and she's been sort of blamed for being the insane person in the family, you know, because she got away, basically. So when the mother came, I still didn't, didn't really know about the internet thing, so when his mother came and he said, oh, you know, I want uh, mom and I to spend Christmas with Heather, and I again said, yes, that's perfectly fine. And um, Heather went to spend Christmas with them, and I said to them, but if Heather wants to come home at any time, then she must be allowed to come home. Um, then on Christmas Eve, his uh, mother phones me to wish me a Merry Christmas for you. And um, she says to me, um, we, were, we were at your house today, but you weren't there. And I said, yeah, but uh, I said, uh, your son just is not allowed to come to my house because he has assaulted me many times and he is not allowed to come here anymore. And she said, oh, that's terrible, you know. And I spoke to Hedda, and Hedda actually wanted to come home that night. Um, then I decided on Boxing Day that uh, I now need an avio because he's not going to ever respect my boundaries and what my needs are for my safety and my well-being. So I went to the police, and after, you know, all those, times eventually they gave me an AVO and then well, now what's what's that is that a protection order that's a domestic violence order it's called in Australia okay um, and they said they would serve it upon him around the 4th of January um, Heather came back um, on the 5th of January to me after asking to come home but they wouldn't let her come home and she had lots of eczema again. And uh, Hedda, and, and we had a lot of storms that Christmas. Uh, in Byron Bay, we had enormous storms. You know, thunder and lightning and heavy rain and it's, it's quite extreme weather. Um, and um, Hedda came back to me and she said that her grandmother and father had said that our home was not safe because if lightning had to strike, then it would kill us. So when, when she came home with that kind of thing, I thought this is really insane to say this kind of thing to a little girl and make her so afraid. And um, So that was the beginning of, of this nightmare where it really took off full on. Um, so she was meant to go back and spend time with them from around the middle of January. And he phones me the night before, and he says to me, I want um, you to drop Hedda off with her passport, because we are going to Sydney. Uh, and I said to him, well, why do you need her passport? She's never needed a passport when I've flown with her to Sydney before. Um, he then starts sort of getting really angry at me on the phone. He says, why have you taken out an AVO on me? And I said to him, well, have you been served an AVO? Because it should have been served then. And he said, no. So I said, well, how do you know that I've served an AVO? And then it became clear to me that he's reading my correspondence. Um, and I said to him, I have to call you back because I have to talk to Hedda. And I said to Hedda, did she know anything about, uh, you know, them going to Sydney? You know, did they say that at Christmas, that they were thinking of going to Sydney for a holiday? And she said she had never heard them mention that. And Hedda said to me, Mom, I don't want to leave this area at all. I don't want to leave. I don't want to go. So I went to another friend's place because he had threatened me to come and pick her up. So I went to her friend's place and got her to call her father and to tell him herself that she didn't want to go. Um, 
And uh, what happened after that was that me and Heather were walking through the local town, uh, Brunswick Heads, which is sort of the seaside town closest to Malambimbi. Um, and we were being stalked by them. And uh, the grandmother comes out of the car and starts chasing us on the street. Um, oh, wow. It's ridiculous. I mean, really, like, insane. You know, like, chasing us. And she's a big woman. She's, like, almost six foot and really big. Um, and she runs right in front of us, you know, and and start saying, saying things to Hedda, and, my, and I let my daughter's hand go to see how, how she reacts, you know, and she's just like holding my, she won't let my hand go, and uh, I just said to his mother, you know, you have to accept things sometimes, you know, and I just walked away, and I decided to call the police, but uh, they got to the police before me, it's a very small town, and they were standing outside the police station. And, uh, you know, it was like, I feel that what they were planning was to abduct her back to the UK at that point. So I didn't feel safe. I mean, I called the police. I said, why haven't you served the AVO that you said you were going to serve? So then the police did go and serve the AVO. But in the meantime, me and Hedda, we were actually invited to Apollo Bay in uh, Victoria. Uh, to her um, ex of pairs wedding. We had this wonderful au pair for a time. She was really wonderful. So she wanted Heather to be the flower girl. Um, so um, I decided to go earlier, buy tickets, go see my family in WA. I had my grandfather's wife and uh, their child, who's my uncle, because uh, my grandfather remarried, so I have an uncle three years younger than me, and he had a child head of age, and I really needed to see my family now. I just I, I found this behaviour so outlandish. Um, so we flew over to WA. I sent him an email saying we were going to be away. He had called my family, and he called the family in Apollo Bay to make sure that we were going there. And so he knew. You know, it was all confirmed. When I came back on the 27th um, of February, we were away about a month. Um, we came back to my home and uh, I was with a friend and her two children as well and the, the federal police arrived, uh, these great big guys with guns, with um, you know, khaki outfits on. They said, we, we taking, we, we're taking your daughter. I said, why? They said, uh, you've absconded with your daughter. I said, I have not. You can um, come into my home. You can see that all my things are there. I have not absconded. I went on a holiday. Um, and the father knows this. And uh, I said, well, you've you got to phone docs, which is social services. Um, they phoned docs. Um, they didn't want to get involved. Uh, the police officers had no papers whatsoever to serve on me. Um, they said, if you don't get your daughter ready in five minutes, and I suggest you get yourself a lawyer, we are taking her by force. Uh, Without an order. I mean, how crazy is that? I mean, how insane is that? It's totally unlawful. It is unlawful. It's criminal. And yeah. uh, uh, they, I said to them, where are you taking her? And they said, we are taking her to Byron Bay Police Station. Um, so I said to Heather, don't worry, don't worry, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay. I mean, I was just really, I was, and, and my poor friend and her children, how traumatized they were uh, as well. And um, so I had to pack things for her. She got in the car. It was just the most horrendous horrendous scene and I think you're familiar with this Goethe what it's like it is yes. a horrendous thing that you can do to a mother and children uh, and I I couldn't actually believe it it was so surreal um, so I, I had to drop my friend uh, Orson Malambindi I drove to Byron Bay Police Station 
But of course they had lied to me because they took her to Malamindi police station. Um, and uh, the police there said it was a mix up. And I said, yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. And um, so I phoned the father and I said to him, you know, what the fuck are you doing? You know, I was so angry and so I couldn't. And he said to me, I'm not allowed to talk to you. Uh, you'll have to talk to my lawyer. Um, and uh, I'll see you in court on Monday. I mean, and even these, these authorities are not even looking at the fact that there's a protective order in place. I mean, this no. suddenly just gets swept no, under I the rug. Said, well, I did mention that to the police, and they didn't care. They said it doesn't matter. It has, it has no relevance. Um, I then had a lawyer, I actually had a lawyer uh, in Lismore, which is about two hours, nearly two hours from where I was living now, in, outside in Malamidbe. Um, we were looking at my domestic violence injuries, because I'd actually got injuries from it, and I could make a claim. And she was actually meant to be a really, really good lawyer for these kind of cases. And I called. And basically, she uh, was all sick at the time, so I just had to take her partner, and I didn't know what kind of lawyer he was. Um, can you believe that then his lawyers never served me any papers for the court? Because I think that basically he did this whole uh, federal magist he, he registered in the federal magistrate court with his lawyer. And they got the federal police to collect her because they, he basically thought that he would get ahead of there and then. He, he, you know, I think he thought that he would get ahead of there and then. And you know that that is the case in some cases, you know. But um, I called the lawyer. He turned up. We went. And uh, this judge didn't, he could see through the whole thing. He knew what was going on. Uh, his name's S.M. Slack, uh, Federal Magistrate Court of Lismore, New South Wales. Um, he didn't like the fact that my daughter was being held at home by a woman that she'd never met before. This was the new partner of my exes, Lenedra J. Carroll. Um, and so he ordered my daughter back to me immediately the next day. That's wonderful. Yeah, so that was really fantastic, and uh, my lawyer was very chuffed. Uh, I wasn't chuffed at all because my daughter had to see him. She had to see him every second weekend and every Thursday. I mean, what kind of protective mother wants their daughter to see them at all when the child doesn't want to go, you know? So I wasn't happy. <laughs> I wasn't happy, you know? Um, but I realized now it was quite a big deal, really. Um, and um, then had a first weekend visit um, when she had to had to go. She said to me, "Mama, I don't want to go. I don't want to go back there to that house." And I said to her, "I said, Hedda, it's the law, and I can't not. You have to go. You just have to go. It's only a weekend." I said, "You know, I'm going to be there. I'm going to pick you up." You know, just call me if you need to talk to me. Well, she, was, she wasn't allowed to call me, so she didn't call me that weekend. Um, she had tried to run away that weekend. Um, and her father had caught her, and he had um, hit her in front of his girlfriend. Um, when Heather returned to me, she was so insular, so completely, almost like she wasn't even alive after that first visit. Um, I said, what is this plaster under your arm? She said, oh, Mama, uh, Dad, Dad said there were mosquito bites. And I thought, what, why is he putting plasters on mosquito bites? So I took them off, took off the plasters, 
Um, at the same time I was granted, at that same time I had been granted a 12-month AVO order. Um, after that, Heather started to birth sores. I mean, she started to what? She started to birth these sores all okay. over her body. Like, it was so extreme, these sores. And um, she was waking up in the night screaming with complete pain while these sores were birthing. And I went to the doctor. Um, they didn't, they said it was shingles. Um, yeah, this is the first picture. That's, it. That's um, how you can see how, how the sores, and that was actually when they were healing. That wasn't even when they were coming out. And um, it was so shocking, and the doctors were getting antibiotic after antibiotic. Nothing was working. Uh, I had to wash, you know, clothes and sheets every day because they said it could be catchy. She didn't. And after a month, the, the court psychologist, Anthony Smith, and my ex husband's lawyer, Bobby Crane, and my lawyer, Paul Denmi, were all pressurizing me and saying if I didn't take her to the psychologist the, at court, there'd be huge consequences. Um, I couldn't believe it. And I spoke to the court psychologist and I said, can't you make a home visit? You know, her head has got a fever, she's really ill, she's, um, she can't go out, you know. Um, um, could, could we show those bit later, Goethe? Yeah. I just want to show the audience uh, what she was suffering from and the fact that the father wasn't even um, responding to those medical emergencies. No. And the courts weren't either. I had doctor certificates after doctor certificates, um, specialists, um, photographs and they didn't care. They don't listen to doctors. They had no respect for doctors. Uh, and going to the court to see this, this uh, Anthony Smith, the report writer, I said to him, I said, how can you make my child come here, you know, under these circumstances? And he just didn't care, you know. It's like, she had to come there, you know. Um, and um, this went on for three months. So Hedda didn't see her father for three months. I was then already under the thing of parental alienation. It was already, I was already labeled with that syndrome. Um, so when she had recovered, when we eventually got the sores to go away, and I think that that was because she didn't have to see him, actually. Um, I decided that with all the pressure, with my lawyer, his lawyer, uh, the child psychologist was saying, you know, she needs to rebond with her father. You're going to have to give her a holiday with her father and make up for all this. Um, lost time and I was like this is so crazy like I, I just I mean I just you know so you know of course you think well you, you don't have a choice you know again so I let her have um, have um, a holiday with with her father um, this wasn't a great holiday. She didn't have a good time. Um, uh, she called me saying that she didn't feel safe. Um, and also when I did actually, that holiday I gave him with her has later been held against me in the court as well. So you, you know, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. 
Yeah, because then they're, they're going to say, like, well, you let her go with him, so there wasn't anything going on for no safety issue. Like, yeah. yeah. They'll twist and turn it in whatever way they want to. That's in right. the case against you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Heather started to have lots of nightmares uh, about her father. Um, and in uh, 2009, uh, November, beginning of November, uh, she was starting to display sexual, sexualized behavior, um, which horrified me. I mean, it was so shocking. Uh, then the father leaves Australia. My partner, I, I had an Aboriginal partner at the time, and his father had, had a, a, a heart attack, and um, he really had to see his father. So I said to my lawyer, and by the way, I've had lots of lawyers, you know, because none of them would act for me. Um, you know, the first lawyer, he was a pervy creep who wanted me to massage him after hours. So I got rid of him, fired him. Got another, you know, I mean, it just goes on and on. I mean, you know, the lawyer story is another whole story, but anyway. So I had this other new lawyer. I think she's number three on the list, Cassandra Bennett from Bangalore. And she said, well, can't, you know, can't he go alone? And I said, no, well, we, you know, he's my partner and, you know, I, my do I would like do my daughter to meet his father. Uh, he's an important uh, Aboriginal man. Um, and so we drove. We drove down. It was, the, it was actually the day after Hedda had seen her father. Um, and she got really ill on the way down. Um, she had a high fever. So we took her to um, Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Adelaide. And it turns out she has a urinary tract infection. And I'm like, is this possible? You know, like, you, you don't even want to think, you don't want to think that, you know, what it is. Uh, we, after we'd seen Bana's father, we decided to go down to Paduna to see his other sisters and brothers, because it wasn't that far where he grew up. And um, uh, Australia has the Nullarbor, it's the longest cliff line in the world, but at the end of that cliff line, with my family in Albany. And I said to him, I said, and when we went to see his sister, his sister said to me, you know, this is, this is molestation going on here. And I just, oh, and Hedda said nothing to me. Um, then we drove, we drove across the Nullarbor. I drove to see my family. I had to see my family. And that's where Hedda made her first allegation to my uncle's partner. And that was just so horrendously shocking. Um, it was so, yeah, I mean, it's just the worst thing ever that, you know, that a mother can experience. Um, so we went to the Albany WA police station. They said, no, well, we can't do anything because the molestation took place in New South Wales didn't take place here, you know, and they carry on like that, you know, like this whole ping pong ball game. Yeah, same thing happened in my case when yeah. my daughter disclosed in the Netherlands, they said, um, that's a crime that took place in the United States, that's so right. we, we can't right. do anything, we can only refer you to CPS. And it's insane, Goethe, it's insane, it's insane. Um, yeah, I feel for you, God. A nightmare. Um, then we had to drive, of course, back to the through the, back across the Nullarbor, you know. Um, and um, we came to Faduna, and his sister said, "I want you to report it to the Faduna police," you know. So we reported to poli uh, Faduna police, but then again, you know, they said, "Well, we're not specialists in this area, so you need to go to the Adelaide police." in Adelaide. And we were about to do that, uh, and then the father returned, and then I got a phone call from my lawyer. And my own lawyer 
threatened me with jail. And she said that if I didn't put Heather back on a plane to her father, the federal police would come and pick me up or I would go to jail. My choice. That was my choice. And you know what it's like. It's like, what good am I going to be in jail to Heather? Um, I don't want her to be picked up by the federal police again because that was just, I mean, it was so horrendous experience for her. So I was forced to put her back on the plane to from Adelaide to New South Wales. That's horrific. After she has just disclosed, I mean, it's just it's it's awful. I I really want the viewers to understand what this is like for a mother to have to do this after your daughter has just disclosed molestation to be forced to put him on a plane to the perpetrator. I mean, to me, it was like the hardest thing I've ever done. You know, the hardest thing I've ever done to tell you the truth. I mean. And, I mean, I had to drive back, um, and she was calling me saying she was feeling unsafe and she was unhappy, and I drove like crazy, you know. And you know how dangerous it is to be in that state and having to drive a car and it was far. But I did. I, I got back. Um, and when I got back, um, the father had uh, turned off my electricity in my new home. So... My fridge was completely, uh, all the foods in the freezer, you know. He used to do things like that, you know. Um, and uh, actually I forgot to mention when we were in the other house, he planted two black snakes in our house, which could have killed Heather. Um, anyway, so we got back and I picked Heather up and she had this great big lump on her, on her neck, like this size all the way down. She was in such a state. And you know what it's like. It's like, you know, then you have to heal your child and you're under all that stress and you're trying to make it okay, but she has to go back all the time. Then I fired this fucking lawyer who screwed me, so I got another one. And uh, I, I'd wanted this lawyer all along and her name was Nikki Brooklyn. And she was known to be quite a hard nail. Um, and she immediately believed my believed my daughter, and she immediately immediately put into place. But then, of course, it's the monitored visits that get put into place. And so, the monitored visits get put into place. My daughter has to go. We have to drive now nearly well one and a half hours. We had moved a bit. We were on the coast now, living on the coast. Oh, I forgot to mention, the reason why I left the other place, the other house, the idyllic place, was because my ex had um, was having an affair with my landlady and had got her to try and evict me out of my home. Oh, my God. This is why I had to move. So I moved to, we moved to a place by the ocean. I had to put that one in there. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah, this is, uh, I mean, there's so much stuff I couldn't even tell you half of it. All that and the snakes and the refrigerator it paints an interesting picture on top of the molestation and the assaults. That's right, yeah. And, um, you know, so basically when we're driving to these monitored visits, my daughter's throwing up in the car. Every time she doesn't want to go, so we have to go and see doctors every time. And the doctors are saying, you know, this has got to stop, you know. And I'm saying, why can't you stop it? I mean, don't you have any authority to stop this insanity? Like, my daughter doesn't want to go. She's sick. She's throwing up. She doesn't want to go. And yet the, the, the law is saying she ha we have to turn up there, regardless of how sick she is. And um, by the fifth visit, uh, my barristers now, I have a barrister called Simon Priestley from... Uh, Lisbon Chambers, because, you know, there, I don't know about where you are, but in Australia, you have to have a lawyer and a barrister. You don't just have a lawyer. So you have to pay a double whammy. And also, I was paying, and my ex got free legal aid. Um, 
And my barrister said to me, Scotty, you have to make her go into that centre. And I said, I'm not making her go if she doesn't want to go. So the first time we arrived there, we had three big adults, two men, an ex-policeman. These are the kind of people that monitor children, by the way, there. Uh, and another big guy and a big woman, and they're standing there and they say to Heather, you, you know, your dad has driven a very long way to get here, even though same distance, you know, we drive the same distance. And you have to go in and say hello to him. And we'll be there, we'll protect you, and you only have to say hello, and then you'll come out again. So Heather was bullied into going in there. And she went in there, and I was standing right by the door, and she said, okay, now I've said hello, now I want to go out, and they wouldn't let her out. They made her stay there two hours for the entire stay. I don't know what they told her, I don't know what they did, but after that she went in each visit. Uh, well, they probably they probably threatened to to take custody away from you or something, you know? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah. Um, so, um, then uh, they got rid of the judge, the original judge we had. Um, they got another judge, the right kind of judge that they wanted for this case. And her name is Anne D. Mack from uh, Brisbane. Um, they also got the right family report writer, Barbara Davies. Um, so what happened next? Yeah, then it was... Um, Yeah, basically, uh, after the visitation with her and him, uh, and we had the main court case on the 8th, uh, I mean the uh, 12th of um, August 2010, um, what happens there is that I have um, 25 affidavits from local people stating what a fantastic mother I am. I have a lot of them coming to court to support me. I had Hedda's uh, father, my ex's um, stepmother, flew all the way from South Africa to support me um, because she believed that he was not at all capable of being a, uh, a good father, a single parent, or at all have custody of Hedda. Uh, his sister, Annie Deer, also supported me by saying the same thing. His ex-wife, Cordelia Donahoe, also supported me in saying that she didn't believe that he was um, fit to be uh, a sole custodian because of her experience of him and how, how violent he had been with her. And she had provided even a letter that he had written to her about that. So I had so much evidence of his persona. Uh, he wanted me to have a full mental what do you call it, mental health? Um, like an evaluation. Yeah. So I said, no, I'm very happy to do that as long as you have one. And of course he wouldn't have one, so we never had that. So I never had any, uh, you know, uh, blame for being mentally unstable or, or such thing. Um, but, um, uh, oh yes, that was the other thing. I, I want to talk about the family report writer, Barbara Davies. Um, she, I was not allowed, my lawyer told me I was not allowed to provide any evidence to her other than my AVO, my domestic violence report, or my, you know, that I was granted, and my domestic violence um, uh, counselling report. But I wasn't allowed to give any other information to her than my interview. The mother, uh, I mean the, the father, my ex, Chester, and his girlfriend, Lynette J. Carroll, had written a manuscript like this, which they had given to the, um, the family report writer. Uh, when I got the family report back, she said that I was um, 
abusing my daughter because I had made the allegation. Because when she had interviewed Heather, the way that she made the allegation was very vulgar. So they couldn't be true. Now you tell me, how can a seven-year-old, or no, she was eight then, sorry, Heather was eight, how can an eight-year-old be vulgar? Uh, basically, I, uh, yeah, so, so the report was very damning, and she was basically saying to switch custody. Um, and I sent the report to two family members, um, but they were abroad. They weren't in Australia. Uh, my lawyer, Nikki Brooklyn, she found out that I'd sent these reports to the family. Um, and she said, I'm afraid I'm going to have to step down from your case because that's illegal. This is a week before my final trial. Um, not because these are confidential reports or something? Is that the reason why she objected to that? Uh, but I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah, she should have told you. <laughs> and uh, not only did she step down from representing me in my case, but she passed that information on to the other side. So when I was in court next, my barrister was nearly knocked off the case as well because of that. Um, so I ended up having to fire her. Well, well, she fired her. I mean, she, she resigned. <laughs> she resigned, you know. So I, I went back to using another lawyer that I had called Ben Krasenstein. He was also a snake. He used to accept money under the table when he worked for another company. He used to say, you can pay me, pay me $1,000 under the table. Like really disgusting. Um, anyway, he he. Re I had to have a lawyer that knew my case. So I had a week, you know. And so I had him, and I had uh, Simon Priestley from uh, Lismore Chambers. Um, so the the case is now, you know, you know, my my barrister is basically he he cross examined uh, Barbara Davies and said that you know, her report was unscientific and, uh, you know, there, there was no evidence of her findings. You know? Yeah, it was all his stuff that he had thrown at them. Yeah, but um, I think that my barrister was paid by my ex-husband's girlfriend because she was quite well off. Um, and so after, I think, two days things really turned because when it came to my turn for my for because um, my ex-husband had all his witnesses before mine and uh, he didn't have witnesses in Byron Bay he only had family abroad and they had them on the phone and he had family supporting him um, because they were going against his sister, you know, it became like a whole family snake pit feud, you know. Um, and anyway, so um, on that day that I was going to have all my witnesses heard, I was called into my barrister's chambers with my lawyer and my, um, my, my daughter's grandmother from her father's side was with me. She was a forensic psychologist in South Africa, and she had gone to many court cases. And um, basically, they represented me with this paper, and they said, if you don't sign this paper, you will never see your daughter again. Oh, that's, that one sounds familiar. I've heard that one before. <laughs> Same uh, thing happened. Yeah, I've, I've heard that afterwards as well. Um, so at the top of the paper, it says basically, uh, do you agree or disagree? And I, of course, circled disagree. And I had to say that there wasn't enough evidence of my daughter's abuse, even though there was psychologist report from Liz Fallon stating everything in there. All these people that had witnessed my daughter with her sexualized behavior, uh, his, his, you know, all I had such incredible evidence of, of what was going on. 
So I said to I said to Sheila, Sheila Berry, the la, you know, head of grandmother by proxy, I said, I can't sign this. She said, Gotta, you're gonna have to sign it. If that means that you can't see Heather again, you're gonna have to sign it. It's pure extortion. It is a blackmail. It's blackmail. And so I had to sign it. But of course then when I go into court and Dean Mac says, Well, now you're going against everything that you've stood for, you know. Yeah, same thing happened to me. The exact same it's thing. It's it's like it's 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 like a standard thing. Um and do you know the main reason why I lost custody of my daughter is because I was too enmeshed with my daughter. I was too enmeshed. Yeah, how about attachment parenting? That's supposed yeah. to be the best thing for the kids, and then it gets used against us. It's so disgusting. I mean, it's against everything that stands for Mother Nature and Nurture and... And, and you know that... I had I had my daughter at the court, and the judge didn't want me to even be allowed to say goodbye to her. Our stories are so similar, Scott. <laughs> it's yeah, ridiculous. Well, I can tell you, good. So there are other stories out there that are the same. They're the same. Yeah, as a matter of fact, there are globally an estimated eight million of us. Um, you and I are in another separate section of those 8 million because we are also dealing with international aspects which makes our cases even so much more complex it's a nightmare. It's a because nightmare. We, we have about 45 minutes and I want to make sure we get your story in yes. at this point do I understand it correct that when he got custody of her he took her to the UK? No, um, that wasn't, there was a bit more to it than that. Um, okay. He, he, um, well, then I got six months monitoring visits. Okay. Uh, I had to do monitor visits with her, and then after six months I could see her on weekends. Um, you know, and the first visit he held her away from me, and it was on my birthday. Um, it was wonderful, you know. I hadn't seen her for a month, um, so I had to wait, you know, I had to wait uh, six weeks before I saw her. And she was so ill, she was so depressed, filthy hair, completely neglected with clothes and, oh my God, you know, um, I don't know if you know about orb photography, but um, we had our picture taken that day and there was two orbs on the picture like these protective entities, you know. I mean, it was just, I just thought I was going to die, you know. And after losing her, I mean, I, I thought I was going to die. Luckily, I had girlfriends that looked after me in that period. I also lost my original partner because he was very per persecuted through my case because, you know, a, a white woman having an Aboriginal partner is still frowned upon in Australia. And uh, he was fighting for land rights, and they were also using that against me and saying that I was financing him, his people, and, you know, it was just... That's so awful. Lost, so he lost the plot, and um, so I didn't have him anymore. And, uh, and having to see my daughter like this, I just... I thought, I have to go abroad. I have to... I have to... I need family, I need friends. I went on one trip abroad. Um, uh, just a two-week visit in between the monitoring visits um, just to meet his sister who had supported me and uh, my grandfather had died a few years before and I promised to return his ashes to Scotland and I just needed to do something really beautiful so, you know, for someone because otherwise I, I just didn't know how I was going to live you know uh, so I did that, and uh, I came back, and I made sure I was at that visitation centre when I got back. Um, and he didn't turn up with her that day, you know. And you know, this is what really I think is so criminal: is that you know they don't get punished, they don't get fined, they don't, you know, they just do what they want. And these orders are only in place there for us, not for them. 
Um, then came the first weekend visit, um, which is actually my photograph that you have on my page of me and Heather. Yeah, which one? Uh, where I'm wearing white and she's in the stripy outfit. Um, and that was our first day that we met out of the centre. And I had a friend that was a photographer and uh, I said, please, can you take some pictures of us? Uh, I said, I know it's a bit crazy, it's the first time seeing her, but I, I just, I need to take some pictures. I'm not sure I'm sh going to be sharing the right no, one. You don't have to share that. You don't have to share that. But it's on my front, uh, my front pe picture with me and Heather that you've advertised. So. Oh, okay, on the show announcements. Yeah. So we did some wonderful pictures, and then I saw her once more, and I just knew that um, I wasn't going to see her anyway for much longer. I just knew it. You know, I knew that, I knew what was happening in me, you know, and I needed to see my family. And it was the hardest thing I ever did because I had to leave, basically. Um, I, was, I also had to leave because I had no income. Uh, I'd lost, you know, my income for her. Uh, I'd lost my partner. Um, I'd lost everything, and I had very little money left. In fact, I, my, my, one, my lawyer, Ben Krasenstein, was spying on me in the bank to see how much money I'd left, so how much more they could screw me for. But uh, the lady in the bank actually had a similar story to me, and she got away from her abusive ex, and she took all my money out, and I had to put it in a safety deposit box in another place. So I was living out of a safety deposit box for quite a while and I had enough to get myself back and I knew I had to get out um, out of there um, and get support and um, you know what it's like you just you need support you know and people don't understand the situation I think it's a normal like divorce case you know um, so I went to Norway um, no, I went to England, that's right, I went to England first, um, I didn't know what to do, um, I ended up living in a convent for a while, um, and uh, Hampstead Convent, um, and the sisters there were really fantastic to me, they were so supportive, um, and then I ended up deciding to go back to Norway, um, and I was going to study, I wanted to study theology. So I got into, uh, I was in London um, and went to the Norwegian Seamus Church and uh, chatted to the priest there and he got me into the school um, and I even, you know, which was like unheard of. I mean, it was holiday time, you know, so it was like kind of a miracle I got in there. I uh, went back to Norway um, and had it really tough because it was really hard to get cheap accommodation, um, but I started my studies and I thought, you know, this is going to be good for me to do this, I have focus, um, but of course then I get dragged into court again. Um, in 2011, uh, I get dragged into court uh, at Lismore again. Uh, by this time, the father has already moved my daughter from uh, New South Wales to WA, which is a five-hour flight. Um, Sheila Berry, who had supported me, uh, head of grandmother, she um, said, Scotta, you have to go. You have to go to court. You have to. I'm going to come. I'm going to come. I'm going to support you. So again, you know, I'm not, you know, it breaks up my studies. I go all the way from Norway to Australia to uh, Lismore to the court. Um, I have a different judge, Judge Jarrett. I tell him, look, you know, I've, I've not had my visitation. Uh, my weekend visitations. I would like some makeup time. I want to see my daughter. I'm going to throw over to WA. Um, he has removed her from the state to there illegally, and he was meant to allow my daughter to finish her schooling here. All this was in the final orders, and the judge said nothing. He just said, "You'll see your daughter." That's it. Then I fly over to WA. 
I, I get an email from his lawyer the night before I met you, and she said, she's on school holiday, school camp, you can't see her. Then I have my family over there, which he's been contacting and seeing them. And the only reason why he moved to WA was to talk to these people because he wanted to convince them that he was not guilty of the molestation. That's the only reason he moved there. Um, I got my family to call him. Um, so I got four hours with my daughter on a lawn in South Fremantle while he was watching. That was just horrendous to see my daughter, greasy hair. She was just completely depressed. Um, I mean, I brought her loads of gifts from the whole family. You know, she has lots of aunts and cousins. And it was just so heartbreaking to leave her there after four, you know. And you can imagine all the flying and everything. I mean, it's just insane. So I went back. Um, and then in 2000, and, uh, oh yes, yes, at that hearing, the judge said I needed to get a lawyer and they wanted to have another case. So I said August. But I didn't know what to say because I didn't expect that, you know. So um, August came, August 2012 came. Um, and um, basically, um, I managed to get a lawyer in Sydney this time because I thought I'm not having a single lawyer from that area because they've all screwed me and I just don't actually want another lawyer from that area. Um, and I thought that would make a difference. Well, we all know now that it actually doesn't. But uh, at the time, I still didn't know. I didn't know what this game was. Um, so I got this lawyer and he asked the judge to have it adjourned because he needed to be familiarized with my case and it was a very long and complex case. Um, she refused. Now it's Anne DMAC back on case again. Um, oh yes, and by the way, when I went there to the court, to Lismore Court, he didn't have to appear because he lived in WA, but I had to come from Norway. Um, uh, you know, and um, anyway, so then uh, basically Andy Mack uh, denies this lawyer to take my case. Um, she refuses to adjourn it. She refuses to accept my affidavit and threw it out of court and allowed the father to go anywhere in the world with his daughter and have to give me a month's notice. But if he goes to the UK, he doesn't have to inform me at all. While he's in contempt of court all this time. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, I mean, when, when I went to court uh, that time in New South Wales, when I had to come from Norway, that's when he was granted the move. But in the meantime, he was in contempt of court. Um, and um, I think that what Judge Ann Demack did was completely criminal because I had, I had no say in anything. Um, I also tried to prevent my daughter from getting an a, um, Australian passport because she has a British and Norwegian passport and I know that you can't have more than two in some countries. Um, so I, I applied, I, I did a lot of work with all this stuff, but of course they overruled it. So she got an Australian passport. Um, I then, um, then in 2013, January, February, uh, well actually in, in December, the father took my daughter to England, um, but he wouldn't allow me to see her in England and he wouldn't come to Norway. But in January, February 2013, he, he said I could see her for two weeks because he didn't have a babysitter for him to wind up his life there. And um, I had a friend in Bunbury uh, in Australia, uh, it's outside Perth. I'd known her for 25 years. And I, she has a big family, the Italian, wonderful family. Um, and I said, would you have me come and have her stay, you know, so we could stay together. Um, and she said she'd love to have us. So he went to see her, and he basically um, said to the family that 
in order for Hitler to stay there, they had to accept that he was not guilty of the molestation. <laughs> Which infuriated me that they had to say yes to that, you know. This is ridiculous. Insane. But I got to spend, uh, now you can show the second picture of my daughter's face. Which one is this? It's one of her face. It's a really bad one of her face. I think it's just a okay, when she starts um, having the breakouts? Yeah. It's, um, because she started having more um, skin problems. Yeah, now this is how my daughter met me when I met her in Bunbury, uh, January, February 2013. That's what she looked like when she came to me. Um, I cleared that up within five days um, of giving her lots of love, nurture, um, dietary changes, lots of juicing, greens, and uh, natural creams. Um, after those two weeks, she stayed with me. She didn't want to go back to him. She told him in front of the whole family, I want to live with mom. I want to go to Norway. Um, it was the most horrendous departure because she was screaming and kicking and screaming, you know. And uh, the family were horrified. Everybody was horrified at the whole situation. Uh, that night she got home. She called me and she said that he's been hitting her because she wanted to live in Norway and uh, live with me. And uh, I couldn't do anything, Goethe, because I tried the police last time I was in WA and they said to me, your case is in New South Wales, you're going to have to take it up with that court. Yeah, this is the issue really, is that they keep shuffling these, the jurisdiction around and it gets to be extremely complex. And I kind of want to touch on that because um, your case really explains how um, complex it gets and how involved it gets. And if you go to my website, shreejasmine.com, and you click on the reflection page, um, and you scroll all the way down, I actually address this issue in the solutions um, where I'm talking about international custody situations. Um, and one of the things that I'm suggesting is that, you know, protective models should be facilitated with the ability to relocate to their country of origin. Um, and as, yeah, as things stand now, um, only 1% of protective mothers is allowed uh, to relocate, which means that, you know, it, your case um, hasn't even gotten to the Hague Convention Treaty uh, at this point. But in most international cases, the Hague Convention Treaty uh, is brought into these international custody battles. And um, there's an article, Article 13, in that treaty that is supposed to protect the children from these types of situations and it's supposed to protect them from abuse and domestic violence. They don't want that involved in the treaty because they worry um, that it's Article 13 is going to be used by either parent to, to pull on the child in these international matters. However, um, you know, I my uh, goal is to actually have the opposite to occur. We need a multidisciplinary panel to evaluate case by case what is going on. And the kind of coercive control that you're dealing with and the molestation and the abuse and the physical, um, you know, reaction of Hedda that she had because of her stay with her father, these things should trigger that Article 13 and should protect any child in such a situation. And then these children should have global jurisdiction so they cannot be held in a country, right? Uh, then the other thing that you're going to have, once it gets real complex, and I've, I know some cases where 
there are multiple countries involved with multiple languages. And when she, once you try and uh, have these international litigation procedures take place, you now also deal with all these different languages. So the other thing that I'm suggesting is that all the judiciary actions should be executed in English to prevent uh, parents to have to translate all their documents and spend, you know, outrageous fees. Absolutely. Absolutely right? Uh, well, I just wanted to say something there, Gersh, if I may, like the, uh, my, my ruling of uh, my case um, with the judge. She said that Heather had no reason to have any ties to Norway or her family. You're from Norway, and that's her heritage, and that judge is no, is, has no right to make a statement like that. I mean, it's outrageous. It's outrageous. Uh, cruel. She's really cruel. She's a very cruel. She was a very cruel, biased judge. Now we have about fifteen more minutes, so we might have to speed up your story a little bit. Okay. All right. Well, then, then, uh, then, of course, they went to England um, in uh, uh, March twenty twenty thirteen. Uh, I spoke to my daughter once, and then he disappeared. Um, well, no, I found out where they were living, and I didn't think that where she was staying was a suitable place for her, so I called Ealing Social Services, and um, they wouldn't get involved. They went there and said everything was fine. So my case with the social services is the same all the way through. They, they don't want to get involved in my case. Um, then I managed to get to, then she disappeared. He disappeared with her until July 2013. I'd been trying to find her through schools, through, you know, uh, it was a nightmare. Uh, eventually, he, he contacted me and said where they were staying in Surrey, in Guildford, um, and he said I could see her for a weekend, day visit. So I went with a friend, um, and he wanted to be there with her. So he came with her and she was looking absolutely terrible. Um, I actually, she wanted me to come home to her home uh, and I was with a friend so I said okay. So we went to her home and her home was just, it was so shocking where she was living. Um, it looked like, I don't know, it hadn't been clean for weeks and weeks. Um, feces in the toilet, you know, like really disgusting and her, she had like a bed, a double bed on the floor and just no regard or care for her room and her dirty clothes and the drawers. I actually went in there and started cleaning and cleaned out everything. Um, uh, the atmosphere was so bad in there that I nearly threw up. So I called social services again, and um, I managed to get a lawyer called uh, Anne-Marie Hutchinson. And um, it took from July till January for me, and I got legal aid this time. I got legal aid, uh, but it took that long. And so my case was in April 2014. Marie Hutchinson met me for five minutes once and gave the case to an assistant who was pretty hopeless, um, Sarah Bandar, and Ben Hodge, I mean Ben Hodge. Um, when our case came up in April at the Holborn Central Family Court, I was given a barrister who was about 26 years old. He never met up with me, he was meant to meet up with me. He was 20 minutes late coming to court. Um, he spent more time talking to my ex than to me. Uh, it was so blatant in the UK. It was so blatant, the whole setup. Went in, the judge uh, wanted to give me weekends with my daughter. Uh, the father refused. Uh, the father was meant to bring Heather to court. He didn't bring Heather to court. And then, um, uh, of course, I booked my ticket back and I didn't have money to sort of change my tickets and stay an extra week. So my, but I said, but don't worry. 
it's fine. I'll call you a week and I'll call you in the morning and we'll discuss what we're going to do and then, you know, you know, don't worry about it. He called me at 1.30 the next week saying that we, it has been decided that you can come to, the, to England once a month and see Hedda from 9 to 5 on a Saturday and on a Sunday and you have to pick her up at 9 o'clock at Cobham Station and take her back uh, to Waterloo 5 p.m. So I did that for a year, Goethe, and um, it was really horrendous because uh, what kind of quality time do you have when you're traveling eight hours of that time on trains? Um, and Hedda getting fed up, it's weekends, she wants to sleep in, she's tired. The school work is so heavy these days. And um, so, you know, and it, it, it you know, the, the, the encouragement and discouragement from his side made it, it just got worse and worse and worse, even though I tried my best to give her the best time. I took her to this beautiful place, you know, to, she loves animals, I thought we'll go to the zoo, although I actually hate the zoo myself, but just doing things that, you know, that would connect her to life and living. And, um, um, yeah, that's one of the, we went to the aquarium actually that day, that picture was taken. Um, and, I mean, Hedda loved seeing me, but it was, she was under so much pressure and stress from, from her father's side. Um, and also, I think, you know, what kind of natural relationship do you have when you have to see somebody just for a couple of hours um, and then they have to go back and then have to see you the next day, you know, and not be able to stay overnight. So when July came, when I'd done a whole year of that, I decided to take Hedda for a women's circle, you know, for her 13th birthday. And uh, I'd drawn up a, a really reasonable uh, contract with a lawyer in Norway for her father to agree to because I said, now I've done this a year, now you have to up the visit. Now I have to have overnight. That's it. And he wouldn't agree. So I said, okay. I said to, I said to her, I'd like you to stay overnight with me. And she agreed that she wanted to stay overnight. So I kept her overnight. I mean, he tried to make a complete nightmare of it, but I was so determined that, that we were going to do this nice um, rite of passage for her. And I had to have her overnight in order to do that. Um, and um, then I wasn't coming in August because he was doing something with her. Then I came in September and he held her away from me. Um, and I called the police. I, I, I've been told by the Norwegian Embassy that if he keeps her away from me, I have to report her missing, and I did. Um, I got a call from the policeman midnight saying that she was at home, she was safe, but the father wasn't going to let you see her the next day and that I had to take the matter back to court and that he was sorry that I'd come all that way and wasn't allowed to see my child. Now, why aren't police enforcing these orders? That's what yeah, I'm that's what I would like to know so too. How are the police there for? Yeah, uh, when I call the police in California when I haven't had a sign of life in a year and a half, they won't assist me in anything. It's They're just shocking. It's shocking, Goethe. It's shocking. Mm -hmm. It, it infuriates me, you know. Um, and then, of course, it was back to court again. Um, so I went and filed myself, and I'm highly dyslexic, both numerologically and written. So for me, this whole court lingo and the whole situation is an absolute minefield for me. But I went there. I got someone at the court at High Holborn to help me fill in all my forms. I, 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 I handed them in. I paid my fee of nearly 300 pounds, quite a lot of money, just to represent yourself. Um, and I go back to Norway and they send my they send my forms back to me saying that I didn't pay. Now, now, I'm, now I'm really pissed off and now I'm, you know, I'm onto the game now. So I, I email them, I phone them and I send a letter to Sir James Wombey, of the president of the family courts in the UK saying that uh, these people are fucking with me and I've had enough.
okay, you know, and I, this is urgent, I want this into court. I call them and I say that, do you know that my case is listed that day because I use his name. And uh, they put me actually into a court outside London, um, which is in um, Staines Court. I had three judges. And that's, uh, that's when I said, look, my daughter is now suffering from Stockholm Syndrome, and I want a historic report. Um, Judge Goodwill is here from New Zealand at the time doing historic cases in the UK. I want an historic report made on my daughter's abuse. And so they made a thing, you know, to do that. And I was going to have a lawyer, so they, they, they adjourned the case. And I was going to have a lawyer called Claire Roberts. And she also was absolutely just the same sort. You know, they're just there to, to make money out of you, even though it was legal aid. Um, uh, and she didn't get granted legal aid. And um, you know what they did then? Um, they actually, the port, the, the, they're called CAFCAS in England. Um, the CAFCAS officer, uh, they decided to move my case to another court, Rygate Court, new judge. Yeah, they just shuffle you around, and the idea of it is to postpone it and delay it until you start giving up, until you get tired of it, because you're just like, okay, here's another attorney and another judge, and they don't know this entire complex background, so how do you... And, and before, we, yeah. before we get to the end of that, because I think you're... Your story really highlights the international complexity of it. And before you, uh, if you're watching this and you're ever contemplating to move to another country and get involved and have children in our country, contact this organization called Global Arc. They, these are moms in our situation. They have experienced what you and I have experienced. And they started this. Um, organization to prevent situations like ours for future parents. So if you're watching this and you are planning to move abroad and get involved and have a, a child in another country, check out this website. They also have flyers. Um, this is a really good website. They have, they have a Facebook group as well where you can get information and there purpose is to inform you of the complexity that you might find yourself in because as you can see with Scotta's story, with my story, this affects your own life and the life of the, your child for the rest of your lives. I mean, it's, the, the, the impact is so beyond anything that you can even imagine think twice before you relocate to another country and raise a family there. Um, if you are in a situation like this or about to get into a situation where you're in another country and about to face divorce, um, please contact Global Arc and get information and get uh, knowledge because you can see, um, just like in Scott's case and in my case, if you don't have the information, um, you get hustled around like this. Well, I, I, you know, I didn't. I didn't have the information. And Me neither. I, and that's I suffer from so much PST. Yeah. Uh, so chronically all over the place. Oh, we have about a minute left. C give, c bring us up to this point within a minute. Like, how how often have you seen Hedda in the last year and a half? I haven't seen her since last November. Um, I saw her uh, for 20 minutes before a school play where her father denied her to see me before the school play, but she took it upon herself to meet up with me. Um, there was a picture there of me and her with the flowers. Um, she was uh, in a play. She was the main main character in the play. Um, she, was playing she, she looks beautiful. I mean, she's... It looks like she's, you know, making every effort to get in touch with you, and I'm really happy about that. The bond between the two of you is not broken. That is huge. It's hugely important. Yeah. And how old is she now? She turned 15 on 25th of November. 
um, and uh, I sent her, uh, I made her snow mother warrior goddess, uh, snow queen thing, gorgeous thing. Uh, I'm sure she got it. Uh, she doesn't reply to my messages. I have no contact now. He's severed all contact because the last case uh, with uh, uh, Judge Nightingale, um, she has given him carte blanche. Well, I mean, we have to understand the situation uh, the kids are in. Oftentimes, they don't sorry. want to be involved in the back and forth and the end. No, and that's the other thing. And also, I've been denied back to court for two years. They've actually banned me from court. Um, She's almost there. Let's have let's let's look at that in in the few seconds that we have left before we get to the um, the final part of this show. I think with every the horrendous complexity that you have been through and Hedda has been through, mm -hmm. the good thing is that she's at an age where this is not going to go on forever. You know what I mean? Like uh, that is a hopeful a hopeful note to leave your case on in the sense that you know when she's eighteen, she can get out. And for all the people that are watching this, protected mothers who are watching this, if you're in a hate convention case, when your child is 16, the hate convention is over. Um, the child can go to the consulate of the country of the mother and um, make the choice to, to go home to mom. I think that's important to point out. Since your case is not a hate convention case, um, yeah. you'll probably have to wait till 18. So, you know, I wanted to say hang in there. Um, uh, I, I just, uh, you know, I really, uh, I know we don't have time, but I really wanted to show the Bohemian Grove video, but you could post that maybe onto my link, um, just to kind of understand what is happening. Well, I know you wanted to share that, and I'll, I'll share my screen here so people can find it. Um, what's really important to point out, and I think that's the context in which you're bringing this video in, is to understand that this judicial child trafficking happens at an elite level. And when people have money and connections, um, these children are trafficked, sex trafficked, through the courts. And the, the, the elite pedophilia, I mean, it really goes up into government. Um, it goes up into world leaders. Um, and they do bizarre rituals. Uh, the Bohemian Grove well, is... It's the, burning uh, of care. it's the burning of care, which is the burning of nurture and care in the world. Yes, it's 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 an uh, erosion of morals and ethical behavior, and um, I mean these elite people. And when you watch uh, this particular YouTube video, it'll show you that they do satanic rituals to tra to traffic these kids, to abuse them, uh, and get away with it. Um, and it is part of their new world order. Um, you know, agenda. So we've shared that. Um, if you want to have more um, um, information uh, about hate convention cases, there are um, several um, cases online you can find, and I'll share one here. Um, you know, the, for, for the moms that are involved in hate convention cases, these international complex custody cases uh, where abuse and molestation is involved, they are out of control. There are so many of them. This is just one article on it um, that I wanted to share. Um, my own case is one of it. Uh, you know, you can find it um, at the Free Jasmine uh, website that I created, and you can thoroughly read with evidence how these children are trafficked through the Hague Convention. Um, it's a tragedy. It is a tragedy, uh -huh. but I, I want to also, on a good note, say that um, there is uh, help for our children. Um, trauma therapy, which is created by Dr. Franz Rupert, um, they have incredible results for this kind of abuse and also satanic abuse.
Um, so there is actually help for our children when they come back. And um, I think that's, uh, you know, a really lovely thing to to know. <laughs> and to say. Yeah, I, you, you had some um, some links here. Um, also, yeah. Dr. Gabor Mate, when the body says no, which explains why, uh, well, for me, my daughter's situation with her skin disorders because the body reacts to the trauma that they've been through, and uh, this this has uh, been very deeply studied now. It's actually proven. Um, my teacher in Norway, uh, Marta Tosheim, she's actually done a book on skin disorders and how they link to trauma. So um, I wish that doctors would uh, look more into this because they're only treating the cause and not the symptoms. Um, uh, I mean, they're treating the symptoms and not the cause. So, uh, you know, that's very important. And there's also um, Kim Hutchinson, who does some very beautiful meditation. But this is an interview on her, on the, the war of women. Uh, the gender neutrality and the war of, uh, on women is diminishing the power of men and women. And um, I think that patriarchy uh, has a lot to, <laughs> lot to um answer for and I, I really think that um, patriarchy is uh, the reason why we are going through this hell. Absolutely and on that note um, as we all know patriarchy uh, goes hand in hand um, with money um, and I wanted to um, bring this video in that was shared with me yesterday um, let me um, share my screen here, and uh, Biggie's going to um, throw this one live in a second so we can all watch it. Okay. These are judges and attorneys in California, in Santa Clara County, where that are celebrating judicial child trafficking with a Christmas luncheon where uh, the main uh, theme of the song is Get Me to the Bank tonight. It is outrageous how blatantly corrupt the courts are in profiting from cases like yours and like mine and like millions of protective mothers around the world. So Biggie, take it away. Let's watch this one together. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
Well, that's a pretty outrageous um, luncheon that these judges and attorneys have uh, making fun uh, of the money that they make off of our cases. Um, there's no empathy, um, no regards for human rights whatsoever. Uh, and this is really, uh, it paints the picture of what's going on. And I want to point out to these judges and attorneys that had that luncheon that you need to realize that protective mothers around Christmas time become suicidal. And for you all to make fun of that is out of control. I never wish what Scotta and I and all the millions of protective mothers are going through for anyone to ever experience that. But to make fun of it is like making fun of Holocaust victims at Auschwitz. That's right. So people need to get some grip on what they're doing and the impact that they're making on people's lives. It's out of control. It's outrageous. And on that note, I want to wish all the protective mothers around the world and their ch stolen children some kind of a Merry Christmas. You know, despite of the difficult circumstances that we are in, please stay strong. These holidays will pass and we will continue to unite and fight what's going on. And in that Christmas spirit, you know, I'm asking you to please stay strong reach out to each other, you know, on Facebook there are many support groups. We're all in this boat together. If you watched the show tonight and you are alone and you don't have your kids, know that you're not alone. We're with you. We're here tonight live to be with you and to let you know that we love you no matter where you are around the world. And to please hang in there because your survival is number one for your children. They're not going to stay children forever. At some point, our children are going to be grown up and they're going to have their freedom back and they're going to come back to us. And we need you to stay alive and stay strong so we can have that reunion and share those reunions right here on Hells for Children. Scott, I want to thank you for sharing your story with us today on Christmas Eve. It's very special. You did a great job um, describing the complexities of these international cases, of this international elite judicial sex trafficking of our children. And I really, really appreciate it because it really paints the picture of how devastating this is and how complex it is having all these different courts involved and the amount of judges and attorneys involved and the amount of money and heartbreak. All of this causes us and our children. It is just outrageous that this has happened to you and to me and to all of us. So I can only hope that the drama will end real soon somehow we will pray for a divine intervention for your case and hope that you and Hedda will be reunited real soon and you can put this chapter behind you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. And thank you for everyone uh, watching Hells for Children tonight on Christmas Eve and I hope you join me again for another episode of Hells for Children next week. Thanks, and bye-bye, everybody.